What's going on guys, Arava here and welcome back to my Let's Talk F1 series and this is going to be a very different topic of discussion today because we're going to be talking about diffusers, specifically Formula 1 but also just in general every single type of diffuser on any sort of sports cars from your you know, supercars to your LMP1s to your Formula 1 cars how they work and, you know, what's going on, the actual engineering science behind diffusers today. Uh, because, you know, we've got a three-week gap between Bahrain and Spain. Um, far too long, really, to do without a Let's Talk. So I thought, you know what, I want to do a different topic for Let's Talk this week on something, you know, you guys want to know about. And I asked around on Twitter, and it generally seemed you guys wanted to know something a bit more technical about a Formula 1 car, something that you could learn from me from this video. So I thought, you know, what could I really do? And it actually cropped up that, uh, obviously, as some of you guys know, uh, if you're subscribed to me for a bit of a while, you know that I'm currently a first year aerospace engineering student. And uh, this year, I haven't actually learned too much that's been related to Formula 1, apart from one thing. One thing, which is something about how diffusers work. And it's it's something a bit more generalized, not just to diffusers, but it helps. And it's completely the basis for how a diffuser works. And that is something called the Venturi effect. Now, you don't if you don't know what that is, you will do by the end of this video. So sit back, relax, and hopefully this will be an educational, but also entertaining video for you guys to learn a bit more about this pretty big tech thing in Formula 1. I mean, diffusers, the rear end of the car, produces probably around 50% of the downforce of these formula cars so it's a pretty big area of development in formula one you know we've had the blown diffusers we've had you know the exhaust gases going towards the end that the engineers are always trying to get more hot air towards the rear of the car in the past few years and now it's been banned because you've got the tailpipe as you can see in the picture actually you've got a lovely picture of the rear end of the ferrari this year and as you can see now the tailpipe is completely above the diffuser so they can't exploit that kind of avenue anymore and this year they've been trying so hard to try and make it more effective because it is such a big area of downforce for these formula cars and today you'll be learning why it works how it works so let's get straight into it So guys, in very, very simple terms, in one sentence, the diffuser creates low pressure using something called the Venturi effect, and the low pressure versus the high pressure above the car creates a pressure differential, and this causes a force acting on the rear tires of the car, the whole rear of the car, and this is effectively the downforce that an F1 car or an LMP1 car or a race car sees when it works effectively. Now, that's the very, very simple definition, but obviously we're not going to stop there. We're going to continue on, and we're actually going to talk about the engineering maths and physics behind it and why it's actually working, what the hell a Venturi effect is, because obviously I'm not too sure. I, I have no idea of what the ranges of knowledge are of you guys watching. You know, I know some of you guys are younger than me. I know some of you guys are older than me, so I'm not too sure at anyone's technical kind of level of knowledge of this. So I'm just going to kind of try and explain it to you all as if you don't know what it is, but, you know, excuse me if you do know but uh you know i guess it, this is for, for the people who don't know so we're going to start off with some basic concepts that we need to know before we can start off talking about the actual venturi effect in effect itself now the first concept we need to talk about before actually getting to the venturi effect itself is something called q dot now q dot is the discharge of a fluid now this is equal to v times a the velocity times the cross-section area this fluid is flowing through and in this case if you don't know fluid can also mean air because of the speeds the f1 car is going at the air acts like a fluid almost and in this case we're also talking about an ideal fluid which basically means essentially you know when you do a level or gcse they'll say this is what it is theoretically but in reality this and this will happen you know in, in experiments things go wrong this is the same sort of thing an ideal fluid is theoretically this is how we want a fluid to work but in reality obviously fluids don't work the way we want them to especially air air can be very very turbulent if it's moving underneath the car you know even you you know, the vortices you see on top of the car, the front wing, it's never ideal. But in this case, theoretically, we're saying it's an ideal fluid. And the discharge, Q dot, is equal to V times A. Now, by something called continuity, we know that Q dot 1 equals Q dot 2. It's essentially like a force balance, like we see in any sort of force balance in GCSE or A-level sort of, you know, physics or maths or anything like that. You know, forces balance out. You know, if you've got one force going left and one force going right, those will equal either, you know, MA or 0 if it's a static problem. So Q dot 1 equals Q dot 2. So if you have a pipe, the Q dot 1 at the, at the front of the pipe will equal the Q dot 2 at the end of the pipe. 
So that's pretty simple. So that means that V1 times A1 equals V2 times A2. So that's the first concept. That's done. That's the first concept you need to kind of get into your mind and just keep that in your back pocket now. We're going to move that to one side now, to the left. And we're going to talk about the second and final, the only other kind of concept we need to talk about, which is called the Bernoulli equation. So the Bernoulli equation, out of the two concepts today that we're looking at before we look at the actual Venturi effect, this is the one that's more complicated than the other one. So the Bernoulli equation is an equation of energy, and like Q dot, it also has continuity along it, as in it balances out, you know, your Bernoulli equation on the left-hand side equals the Bernoulli equation on the right-hand side, and that's how we start to work out different speeds and pressures in a system. So the Bernoulli equation is as follows. P2 plus half rho v2 squared, so rho there if you don't know is density, uh, plus rho g h2. So that's your left-hand side of the equation. So you've got pressure plus half density times the velocity squared plus density times gravity times height. So that's your, set, that's your first half of the equation, and this is equal to, as you can guess, the same thing but p1 plus half rho v1 squared plus rho g h1. So this is the Bernoulli equation. And now some of you may look at that and say, hang on, this doesn't look like any sort of energy equation as I said it was. But this is actually the energy Bernoulli equation equated in pressures. If we simply times everything by volume, you then get units of energy. Because then what you recognize is that middle term, half rho v squared, turns into half mv squared, which is kinetic energy that you've all learned probably from GCSE physics. So this is definitely an energy equation, but the, at least the way I've learned it from my university studies, I've learned it in a form of pressures, because it's a lot more useful, I feel also personally, in my opinion, a lot more useful in this sort of fashion. But you can also change it for energy units and also in pressure heads, so you can get it in levels of like uh, fluids if you were to try and measure it in the in laboratories or whatever. So we've now got these two concepts, the Bernoulli equation as a whole, and we've also got Q dot, which we know now means V1 times A1 equals V2 times A2. Now, we're using both of these concepts, we can now look at what is the actual Venturi effect and what's behind the Venturi effect. So the Venturi effect comes out of something called, wait for it, a Venturi tube. Who would have thought? So a Venturi tube is essentially what's on screen right now. Imagine in front of you a 3D tube and essentially it's got one big cross section on the left and then it just gets smaller on the right and then probably gets bigger again and you just pass air through this tube and when we pass air through this tube, we can start to look at what's happening with the pressures as we move along from the left to the right. And this will also help us understand why a diffuser works the way it does. So let's say we're looking at a Venturi tube with the opening of uh, area A1 and the speed of the air going in is at V1. And on the smaller side, we've got an area of A2 and the speed coming out on that smaller section is V2. Now, to make things a lot easier, we're just going to look at the pressures and everything, the Bernoulli equation and everything, along the same height. So you can see V1 and V2, the dots we placed where we're looking at, is exa exactly along the same height. This just simplifies the Bernoulli equation, makes it a lot easier. But obviously, you could still analyze this if they were at different heights, if this was an inclined kind of Venturi tube at an angle to the ground, still work everything out. It would still work perfectly fine, but this is just a simpler form, very easy to do for this video. So now that's our Venturi tube. So we'll move that to one side now. So we've got that Venturi tube with different areas and different speeds. Now we go back to what we just learned with Q dot, which is V1 times A1 equals V2 times A2. And now we can start to use this and put it into the Bernoulli equation because we're basically going to substitute it in. Because if you can see clearly that you can actually rearrange this continuity balance into V2 equals V1 times A1 over A2. And so this equation can be plugged into the Bernoulli equation itself. Now, before we get to that, you can still see straight away that this means V2 has to be bigger than V1 because A2 is smaller than A1. Obviously, it's different if A2 is bigger than A1, but we know what A2 and A1 are because of the diagram we saw for the Venturi tube. We saw that A1 is the bigger area and A2 is a smaller one, and therefore V2 is bigger than V1. It's going to be because you have the bigger area divided by the smaller area, which means V1 is always going to get bigger times this factor. And so using this actual fact that V2 will be bigger than V1, if we look at the parts of the Bernoulli equation where V is, which is the half row V squared, 
you'll see that half row v2 squared is going to be bigger than half row v1 squared. Now, that becomes a very important factor when we start to look at the Bernoulli equation across the Venturi tube, which we'll do now. So we've got the Bernoulli equation on screen right now. We've got the Venturi tube itself on the le on the bottom left, and that's just to show and visualize what we're actually working with. Again, remember, we're working along the same exact height, and that means that the height parts of the Bernoulli equation can be completely cancelled out. So they don't exist anymore, and what this means as well is now we can start to work on this equation. Now let's say in an experiment we know P1, we know V1, and we know A2 and A1. Therefore, we know what V2 is going to be. And we just derive that by saying V2 is going to be always bigger than V1 anyway. We don't even need to put any numbers in to tell you that. And that means this part of the left-hand side equation is going to go up. That half row V2 squared is going to go up. And naturally, obviously, as you can probably see, hopefully, force balance dictates that P2 has to decrease. So P2 is now a lower pressure than P1 was at. So P2 in the smaller part of the Venturi tube is now lower than the wider part of the Venturi tube. And this brings us back to the concept that this whole equation is an energy equation. The energy that comes out of the pressure decreasing goes towards increasing the velocity of the air passing through. Because you can't increase half, you can't increase rho, so the only thing you can increase is V2. So that was the engineering maths and physics behind the Venturi effect in the Venturi tube and looking at the concepts of Q dot and the Bernoulli equation to help us derive and work out why this works the way it works. So now we need to look at it and apply it to Formula 1. So we've got a little simple diagram. We've got the floor, which is completely flat, and then we've got the floor of a Formula 1 car. So this is essentially how a diffuser is designed. You've got the floor running along towards the back, and then as it gets towards that rear of the car, it elevates up into a curve and curves upwards. And this is very similar to the Venturi tube. Essentially, the bottom half of the Venturi tube is the floor, the tarmac the car is racing on, essentially. So just like the Venturi tube, the cross-sectional area, instead of it being instead of it being the you know radius squared times pi of the tube, it's instead the area simply from the top of the diffuser to the floor, the tarmac the car is actually racing on. And now applying the principles we just learned about and just learned why it works, we see that as the air moves from the front of the car to the rear of the car, there's going to be lower pressure created at this smaller point, and it's going to gradually go to a higher pressure. It's actually going to equalize out to the normal ambient pressure of the air around the race car. And as this air expands from underneath the car uh, up to the ambient pressure, this creates a big low pressure underneath the car. And this creates a pressure differential because you've got all this higher pressure or ambient pressure of what the normal air pressure is around, you know, just general air if the car wasn't there. You've got all that above, way above the rear wing. And there's a pressure differential there from the very, very low pressure right underneath that diffuser at the lowest point to the highest pressure up top, up on the rear wing. And that pressure differential creates a force acting down on the rear tires. And that creates your downforce of a Formula 1 car. Going back to the Ferrari picture, you can also see they've got four wings sticking out of the diffuser and two smaller ones on the edges. Now these wings don't do anything apart from channeling the air, keeping it as straight as possible. Because in a moving car, when you're going around the corner, the air is obviously going to curve with the corner. It's going to be affected, obviously, as we just said, you know, when we're using all those equations, we're talking about an ideal fluid. But in the real world, the fluid's not going to be ideal. It's going to be very turbulent. It's going to move around. And to solve this, engineers use these slot gaps to essentially just keep the air in check, keep it as straight as possible so it's going straight out, flat out of the diffuser. And that's going to create the most downforce possible for the rear of the car. As well as this, the angle that the diffuser goes up and kind of creeps up from the floor upwards is also very important. Engineers actually need to get this very, very finely right because if it's too steep, the air will start to disconnect. The flow of air coming underneath the car will disconnect and it will no longer be a sort of Venturi tube, if you will, make do Venturi tube underneath the car. It will disconnect and it won't work. So guys, that has been the engineering science and the technical stuff of how a diffuser works. Not just on a Formula 1 car, remember. This does work on race cars, supercars, LMP1 cars. The diffuser will work the exact same way in any of those cars. 
So I hope you guys did enjoy that, and more importantly, I hope you guys did learn something about the diffuser and how it works, if you didn't know already. And if you did, I'd be very much appreciative if you guys could share it with any of your Formula 1 friends or family, or anywhere possible, because I'd really love to try and get this series out, the whole Let's Talk series as a whole. If I could try and get that out to as many people as possible who are Formula 1 fans, it'd be really great. Because essentially, what I'm trying to do, if you don't know with this series, is essentially, obviously, I'm an aerospace engineering student, a first year student, and my goal is actually to... To get into Formula One eventually, and this YouTube channel, although you know pretty cool, I guess, to put on a CV, it's not actually that relevant in terms of the technology, the engineering, the actual academics of you know what I'm doing at university and such. So, this series is trying to make my channel look a bit more academic so I can put it on my CV with confidence of it being actually relative to my studies. Because you know, what I just did there was for the first time use my university studies in you know analyzing Formula One, which is something I haven't done yet. This is the first time that I've actually had to use any of my university studies to do what I've done on this channel. And it makes it a lot more relevant to my studies and a lot more of an actual credible thing I can put. So I'd be really appreciative, guys, if you have any friends or family who are into Formula One, share them this video, share the series out wherever you can. It'd be really, really, I'll be really, really thankful, guys. And if you did enjoy it, again, give it a like. And if you found it informative, then do tell me in the comments. And uh, if, I, if you didn't and you have any kind of criticisms, then do tell me in the comments. Obviously, this is the first time I've sort of done a sort of teaching sort of video so I might have been going too fast maybe too slowly just do tell me in the comments if there's any way to improve my uh, kind of teaching I guess of uh, the maths behind it all but I hope you guys didn't find that interesting even if you're not a very maths type person I hope you could still maybe follow along and find some sort of interest in this very cool piece of technology which is on Formula 1 cars but yeah I'm in Arava hope you enjoy the rest of the day subscribe for new rounds here for weekly F1 content Formula 1 gaming but also I'm hoping more Formula 1 tech videos just like this and you know what? The more people that see this series, the more it'll want me to do this series more and more again. So that's incentive for you guys. But yeah, I've been Arava. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll see you guys next time.